Hello, I'm Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet. Do you want to become a master of veterinary dermatology? Well, watch this video and by the end you'll have my top 10 tips about how to provide really fabulous care for the clients and the patients under your care. For the very best veterinary tips, subscribe to the channel please by uh, pushing on the subscribe button and then click the bell to make sure that you receive notifications as we create more of these short videos for your enjoyment. So my first tip is taking a good history. This is so important, it's fundamental, it's the groundwork that gives you the best chance to be successful with the case. But it's amazing how many people quickly run over it and, and don't pay any attention. The dog comes or the cat comes into the room and immediately you want to touch the animal and, and find out what the problem is. Now, many times in my career, by taking a really good history, I almost knew what the diagnosis was before I even looked at the dog or the cat. I'll give you an example. Uh, two young GPs came in with a dog that was very itchy, had been seen by their own vet, they couldn't come up with a diagnosis, but by taking a careful history, I found out that the GPs were itching themselves. By seeing where the dog was mainly itching, I immediately made a diagnosis of scabies and was able to sort the dog's problem out very, very quickly. So histories are really important and I would encourage you to spend time finding out what the animal's um, diet is, obviously it's signalment, it's age, um, looking at if there are other people in the house that are affected. Uh, does the dog have diarrhea as well? This might be indicative of a food allergy with other skin signs. All of these things are important. Spend time, spend five to 10 minutes taking a good history and it can save you a lot of time in the future. My second tip concerns cats, particularly allergic cats. And it is amazing to me how often I, I've seen a cat that obviously has an allergy of some description, but when I ask about the flea treatment that's being given, it's really not adequate. And this can be sometimes because the vet has said, I can't see any fleas, therefore it can't be a flea allergy. Of course, we know that cats that are flea allergic are very, very effective at removing fleas from them by licking and swallowing them. And in fact, sometimes the best place to find a flea in, a, in an allergic cat is in the feces. So I would encourage you always, when you see a cat that is allergic, even if you can see no fleas, to consider that fleas are involved until proven otherwise and treat appropriately. My third tip is around flea treatment. Obviously over the last 25, 30 years, there's been an explosion in the number of products that we can use to treat fleas. When I first qualified, we had Nuvan Top, the orange tin that hissed when you squirted it on the cat and the cat actually recognized the Nuvan Top and would be very difficult to catch. It also killed pretty quickly, but didn't last for very long. So if two or three days later, fleas came onto the cat again, they wouldn't be killed by the spray. Now we have many products that act quickly, but also last for a prolonged period. And so I'd encourage you to go for one of the better veterinary uh, recommended flea treatments. Obviously now there is the option to treat with spot on, uh, collars, also with tablets. And uh, there are many, many options out there, but look at speed of kill and how long the product will last for and make sure that you follow the instructions of the manufacturers. Of course, one of the major problems that we face, and this is what I'm gonna talk about with the fourth tip, is antibiotic resistance. I was reading a recent article about penguins in Melbourne, and one of the biologists has actually tested for antimicrobial resistance within the penguins who've never had antibiotics 
and she could find that there was antibiotic resistance to some of the bacteria that she found with them. So this is a real global problem and I think we as vets need to take our responsibility seriously in large animal but also in small animal medicine. And my key tip with antibiotics is that we use them appropriately. Very often I see people treating with a lower dose than is required for the weight of the animal and not for long enough. So a dog comes in, it's treated for seven days, the skin looks better, the vet or the client doesn't come back and the animal doesn't get the required three to four weeks that I think that you need to treat with to actually get rid of an infection. Obviously with mild infections, we can try shampoos, but otherwise we should not be afraid of treating adequately for a long enough period with the proper dose. My fifth tip concerns using antibiotics and steroids concurrently. I really don't recommend this. When I was a young vet, I experimented with this in a practice where I would just use antibiotics for three weeks, whereas my colleagues often were using them for 10 days along with steroids. Of course, after 10 days, the skin looked a lot better. The steroids had reduced the inflammation and the antibiotics had probably killed a few bacteria. But of course, steroids will actually hide the real extent of the disease by removing that inflammation and will also make it very difficult for you to make a diagnosis during the diagnostic phase. So I very, very rarely, if ever, will use steroids and antibiotics together and yet I see this happening a lot in practice. So I would encourage you to only use steroids after making a diagnosis or any of the antipyritic drugs that are out there. And then ideally not with steroids because I believe that that will make, will often help to reduce immunity and, and make it more difficult to control the pyoderma in the first place. So treat the pyoderma, see what you're left with, treat uh, concurrent potential allergies with food trialing and flea treatment. And then quite often after three weeks, you will find as I did that the dogs or that were only on antibiotics often did a lot better than those that were on antibiotics and steroids. So think very carefully about using those two drugs together. It is not good practice. My sixth tip is about Demodex. We've made such strides over the last years in treating Demodex. Again, when qualifying, it was a really, really difficult disease to treat. And in fact, sometimes we had to put dogs to sleep that had Demodex because they were so bad. Um, and that treatment has definitely developed over the years. Very much the revolution has happened with the um, discovery and, and the development of the isoxazolines. So all of those drugs seem to have an activity against demodicosis and can be delivered, you know, on a monthly or, or a quarterly basis and will give fantastic results. I think you have to remember with demodex that there are two forms of demodex. There's juvenile onset demodicosis and there's adult onset demodicosis. We think that juvenile onset demodicosis is something to do with, with a, an immature immune system. And sometimes if we can kick that immune system into place or as it, the dog gets older, it develops it, it can sort the problem out itself. Whereas adult onset demodicosis usually means there's an underlying problem. Uh, treatment with steroids, for example, could cause demodicosis or perhaps a dog that is developing Cushing's disease or hypothyroidism. So. A, an older dog with demodicosis needs to be really worked up to see what the underlying problem is. But with a young dog, then we, we consider the demodicosis to be the main problem. And if we treat the demodicosis and treat it adequately for long enough, usually with the isoxazolines now, we will get really high treatment success. Prior to that, of course, we were using drugs like milbamycin, 
ivermectin, which were unlicensed and potentially could have side effects. Uh, I think we all know about the potential for ivermectin to cause death in sheepdogs or in sheepdog crosses. So it's a, it's a drug that thankfully we can avoid now due to the great success of the isoxazolines in the treatment of demodicosis. So please do use those as a first line. But of course, I've also seen studies where people are using isoxazolines with great results, but then using the dam and the sire from that litter to continue breeding because they can sort the problem out with an isoxazoline dose. We know that this will lead to greater problems down the line. So please also remember that when a demodicosis litter is produced, the dam and the sire should not be bred again. My seventh tip is all about rabbits. I think the key message with rabbits is please, please don't use fipronil spray on them. It can be uh, a really serious issue. Uh, rabbits have died because of being sprayed with fipronil. Very effective at obviously getting rid of their their fleas or their, their mites or their lice, but uh, unfortunately can uh, lead to really tragic consequences. So don't use it. There are other products out there like imidacloprid that you can use for fleas. And obviously the other key point is always be checking your rabbit regularly, uh, particularly in the summer, because we know how traumatic it can be for everybody, uh, including the rabbit when there is fly strike. So carefully looking at a rabbit on a daily basis, turning it over to, to look for any wet patches, um, but particularly with flea and, and ectoparasite treatment, please don't use fipronil spray. My eighth tip concerns testing for allergy. We know that out there there are skin tests, intradermal skin tests and blood tests. Which is the better one? I think the first question we have to ask is why are we using the test? I've seen very often that vets can use the test as a diagnostic tool to make a diagnosis of atopy. And actually, atopy is a disease entity that's diagnosed by ruling out the other issues. So I think it's really important that we understand whether we use a skin test or a blood test that we're doing it to decide on what the dog or cat is specifically allergic to with a view to creating a vaccine. There can be other reasons why I might skin test. For example, if it's a summer allergy and I know that by finding out which particular pollens the dog or cat is allergic to, I can help the owner avoid those pollens. So I always take the dog for a walk through this oak forest. If the dog is allergic to oak, let's change the walk pattern. But it, once we've made the diagnosis of atopy and we're thinking about using intradermal vaccines to um, create um, a desensitized animal, then I think there are measures and values in skin testing or in blood testing. When I had my own practice, I used r 2 vitrin skin tests and I used HESCA blood tests. That's because I thought they were the best on the market. Um, I think it's really important that you use the one that you, you are best able to. Skin testing is very difficult to do if you're not doing a large number of them. So I think it is a test that you probably leave to your dermatologist. Whereas a blood test, using a good quality blood test that will um, measure properly and not create a lot of false positives is obviously open to, to many more vets. In my own practice, I often used both tests so that I had the most information I could get to then, by uh, looking at the history, deciding which were most likely to be the most significant allergy. So there's quite a lot of art and science in that creation of a vaccine. And it's why I think that I often found this to be a very successful treatment, whereas vets in general practice may find it less effective because of some of the subtle nuances that I've talked about there. So both can be good, uh, you can use both together, 
um, or you can go with skin or allergy testing. I think the key is to use a test that you know is accurate and is not creating a lot of false positives or negatives. My ninth tip is all about treating for long enough. Do you know, often seeing referrals, I was seeing, seeing dogs and cats with quite chronic disease. And the first thing that you almost have to do is set owner's expectations that this is going to be a long journey. In some cases with allergy, this is a, a diagnosis that you make that says, we will control this dog or this cat's symptoms and this will be a lifelong uh, potential issue. But with appropriate treatment, we can actually keep things together. Obviously with things like deep pyodermas, it's really important to treat well beyond clinical cure. So you continue with antibiotics, particularly feet, demodicosis, sometimes those deep pyodermas that we could see could take uh, several months to really get better because of the fibrosis, getting the antibiotics into the deep tissue and actually having a clinical cure. So I would encourage you with all treatments that this is also about compliance. We often find that uh, clients don't come back. We don't follow them up. They're lost to follow up. We don't ring them to come in for more antibiotics. And we end up again with a problem where we're not sorting it. And of course, we're more likely to create uh, immunity, uh, you know, antibiotic resistance and so on. So do always think about treating for long enough with these conditions. Uh, they, they can be quite long lasting and will need aggressive treatment. My 10th and final tip is all about using the right shampoo. I am a real advocate of shampooing. I think it can uh, really help quicken the actual progression to cure. But I think sometimes uh, shampoos get a bad press because Vets don't understand all of the different types of shampoos and can use the wrong shampoo at the wrong time with bad results. And of course, this puts them off using shampoos in the future. Uh, with uh, pyoderma, I think it's well recognized using an antibacterial shampoo will really help to quicken up the, the cure, and in fact, in some cases, particularly if you have an MRSP case, a, a methicillin resistant staph pseudintermedius, where you can't use antibiotics, then chlorhexidine on its own sometimes can affect a cure. So it's really good to understand how, um, how shampoos can be used. Uh, we also have the colloidal oatmeal shampoos that can be antipyritic and, and can help to reduce itch particularly in those dogs that perhaps you're not giving any antipyritics to, like steroids, because you're about to test them for, for skin allergy and so on. So do look at shampoos as your friend. If you've had a bad experience, it's possibly been because you've, you've used the wrong shampoo in the wrong place. Uh, we know, for example, that with malassezia problems, quite often shampooing once, twice a week might be enough to keep that uh, dog's itch, which can be quite severe with malassezia under control. So uh, do think about shampoos as part of your treatment regime when treating dermatology cases. Now that you know about my top 10 tips in dermatology, maybe you'd like to carry on the journey with Webinar Vets. We're the leaders in online veterinary education and we have over 70,000 vets and nurses in our community. We'd love to see you in there, uh, enjoying further webinars with us. Or maybe you're a student looking for more resources. If so, do check out Wikivet, our free online veterinary encyclopedia to find out more. Do feel free to check out some more videos on our YouTube channel. Also, if you've liked this video, please do click the like button. And if you think other people will like it, please share it with friends and colleagues. And we'll look forward to seeing you on a video, another video very soon. Take care, bye-bye.